Welcome to the Swing Sets. Climb on up, there is always a swing available. On Life on the Swing Set, the podcast, we explore ethically non monogamous relationships, the pleasures and passions, the promise and pitfalls. We discuss all aspects of ethical non monogamy in a fun, open, and welcoming fashion with a gleam in our eye, a bounce in our step, our hands down your pants. Ooh, <laughs> sorry, got ahead of myself. We may be biased. In fact, we most certainly are. But we don't sugarcoat, and each of us speaks honestly and earnestly about our thoughts, ideas, and experiences throughout our very own Lives on the Swing Set. Thanks for swinging by. Hi there, Swing Set fans. If you're anything like us, you'd love to type while we talk. Let's put those keystrokes to good use. While you listen, hop on Twitter and live-ish tweet our episodes by posting using hashtag SSLiveish. That's hashtag S-S-L-I-V-E-I-S-H. Who knows, maybe you will tweet it exactly the same time one of us did, while speaking into the microphone. Yeah. Thanks! From heaving bosoms to fifty shades, erotica can be inspiration, beach reading, or sheer comedy. We are graced with the presence of the queen of sex-positive erotica, Rachel Kramer Bustle, who's joining us here on the swing set to allow us to pick her brain for perspectives on writing erotica, gathering creative community, and living the sexy vibe. Welcome to Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. I'm Ginger Bentham, and tonight I have with me... Hey, it's Techno Geisha. And hey, it's Token Mail, Dylan Thomas. <laughs> and welcome, Rachel. Hi. Yeah, hi, Rachel. Hi. I, I, I'm very excited. I'm actually pretty excited because uh, when Ginger was introducing you, she paused uh, to say every every part of your name, uh, to, just to give it a little bit more gravitas. It was really nice. So uh, style points for, for Jen and style points for you for, you know, deserving it. Absolutely. I have books of yours on my bedstand and in my bedstand as we speak. So do so, I. <laughs> yeah. So it's really fantastic that you could join us on the show. Thanks. So I have to start with a very specific question. What turned you on to erotica? I remember reading it in college, but I don't know if I remember exactly you know, where I found the first piece of erotica I read. I do remember I went to school in Berkeley, California, and there was a bookstore called Mama Bears that I don't think exists anymore. It was this feminist bookstore. I remember shopping there and finding the Virgin Territory books edited by Shar Rednauer that I still own those books. Um, Mm -hmm. They were these first time true lesbian sex stories those and the Best American Erotica series were probably the first erotica that I read. And I I don't really remember why I picked it up because I really wasn't like a sex geek at all back then. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Um, but I do remember reading those stories and just being intrigued, but I never thought then that, you know, it would go on to be something I did. I just thought I was enjoying reading it. Um, and then a couple of years later, I thought I-, I could try this. So so I don't know if I have an exact answer to your question, but it's funny because as you ask that, I'm thinking about like being in that bookstore and looking at those books mm-hmm. and then reading them in this apartment that I had, uh, I guess, however many years ago, that was a lot, 15, sure. 17 what was the that first uh, inspiration to start writing, you know, to get actually going from reading erotica and coming up with your own? What was that bridge into actually doing this? Well, yeah. there, Tristan Taramino has a newsletter called Double T that she's had for a really long time. And I believe it was in her newsletter that I saw a call for a book called Starfucker, which was also mm-hmm. edited by Shara Rednauer, who did those Virgin Territory books. And Starfucker was based on a zine she did of celebrity erotica. And this was 1999. And I was at the end of law school. Long story short, I went to law school (laughs) and I did not finish. But while I was there, I was continuing to read a lot of erotica. 
And I saw this call and I thought, oh, why don't I try it? And I wrote a story about Monica Lewinsky that was a fantasy about me and Monica because it was called Monica and me and the character's name is Rachel. And she goes to a Monica book signing and they get it on. Uh, and she has a lot of the clothes that I have. And, um, you know, the Rachel character <laughs> barely differs from me except that I've never met Monica Lewinsky. And I remember Shar calling me, and this is before I knew her personally, and leaving a message on my voicemail saying that she wanted to use my story. And I, I had that voicemail for such a long time because it was just oh. this amazing experience, I remember. And then I remember standing in a bookstore, which sadly also no longer exists in New York, that story got picked up for Best Lesbian Erotica 2001. And oh. that book oh, came, wow. that book ended up coming out before Starfucker. So, and I saw it on a, the bookshelf. It was at a Barnes and Noble in their erotica section. And I remember I turned to my story and I cried because it was so exciting to me to have been reading erotica by that point, probably for five years, and then have this story published. Um, and it's really interesting because up to then I had never thought about writing fiction. I've always written, but nonfiction. And I've now written a lot of erotica, but I've not written anything out fiction outside of erotica. So I'm not really sure what made me think, oh, that's the one I'm going to try to do this. I, I don't think I was really thinking it about it super hard. I just thought I, I like Monica. I'm interested in her. I know about her. I'll try my hand at this. Wow. That launched quite a career. <laughs> that one moment of listening to your gut. <laughs> Not just that, but that was, so that was like, that came out in around 2000. And then in 2003, I think, yes, it was 2003, maybe 2002. But I met this woman who came to a reading I did and she passed me this note that said, did you write that Monica story? And she was obsessed with Monica too. And then we started dating. So that <laughs> really had this whole life of its own. And then with the whole resurgence of Monica Lewinsky with her Vanity Fair article this yeah, year, recently. it's sort of still in the air. So that story definitely has a special place in my heart. So you were obviously going through law school. So you had to know how to put words on paper in an organized way, but did you, so you didn't really do any writing, fiction writing before this, but did you have a good idea of how to put your thoughts on paper before you started writing erotica or did you have to like, okay. I, well, I don't know about fiction. You know, I don't, I hadn't really written any fiction, but I'd always written letters to the editor and like essays for in my college paper. I actually was really bad at legal writing. I hated it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> feel like I couldn't write because I couldn't quite grasp what they wanted. Uh, and then so that got that first story got published and it was just so exciting. And I pretty much I mean, I mean, it sounds simple, but from there, I just started writing more and more stories. And that's how I wound up starting to edit anthologies and do what I do now. But it's all really been almost piecemeal. Like I never set out to do this for a living. I think I just wanted something different than this boring legal writing I was doing. <laughs> yeah, that that actually leads to something I've been thinking of while you're talking is how did you go uh, from just writing, being the writer yourself and then being the editor? Because you've done so many wonderful collections. Um, what got you in that realm of not only just being the writer, but being the person who picks the writers? Thank you. Um, so while I was, the years after I was in law school, I had random jobs and I was also freelance writing and I was reviewing a lot of books and I was reviewing a lot of books for Allison Publications, Allison Books, which also no longer exists. I feel like I have to keep saying that. <laughs> right now, but um, there's a lot of authors who are still around. So they knew that I was reviewing books and writing here and there. And they asked me to co-edit an anthology called Up All Night. And I did that one. And then another publisher asked me to work with them and a couple other ones. And then after I'd done a few, Cleus Press asked me to work with them, and they're my main publisher now. Mm -hmm. So so really from this, these other kinds of writings and being published in some anthologies is how 
I got on the path of editing anthologies. Mm. So what's the favorite part about receiving uh, all those submissions? You must read a lot of you know diverse uh, topics. I know a lot of the, especially the Cleus books are usually themed. Um, but what is it, I guess, what's the most fun or the most, you know, your favorite part of the whole process? I think it's just reading them all. You know, I don't always read them all at once. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I read them as they come in, but it's coming up with an idea. Say it's orgasms. I've done a book called Orgasmic and one called The Big Book of Orgasms. And, you know, I think I know, okay, this is an orgasm. This is how a story could go. But then people send all kinds of stories about things I never, ever would have thought of. And that is really the part that I love where, you know, it starts from this random idea Oh, not not necessarily random, but you know, you you think you have a handle on what someone might write about, and because people are endlessly creative, they take that idea and kind of twist and turn it, and you know, do whatever their magic is to it, and you get these stories that are just amazing, and it's an honor to get to read all of them and publish some of them, and then revisit them because I've been doing, I've been editing erotica books now for 10 years. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I go back and reread either pieces I've written or pieces other people have written. And it's almost like I'd forgotten all the details because, you know, that's a lot to remember. Um, (laughs) And (laughs) and I reread them. I'm like, this is really awesome. And it's also really fun to get to share them with new people. And I've been teaching a lot of erotica writing workshops. And there's one story that I usually read part of to them, which is from Orgasmic called, and it's called Chemistry by a writer named Velvet Moore. And it's about a woman who's turned on by chemistry and chemistry labs and scientists. And I love it because I almost failed chemistry in high school. (laughs) There's no way could I have even would I have ever conceived of that, let alone try to write about it. But she does it so vividly and it's really hot. And I'm like, if I had known about this, maybe I would not have almost failed chemistry. (laughs) If you could have made chemistry erotic. (laughs) Seriously. It's like when you make history real, you know, when Mm -hmm. it's like personalized or something, it sticks with me a lot more as well. So that sounds so sexy. Science and erotica, like I need to definitely hone in on some of that. That sounds fantastic. Well, and just reflecting on my experience of, I, I love to read. I'm totally a bibliophile and I love the smell of the pages and it alone is a sensual experience for me. And I'm curious in terms of erotica, it also has that, that sexual or erotic edge to it. And I'm, I do my thing. I write a little bit. I read a lot. I'm curious, Rachel, given the fact that you read and write so much of it, how has your experience of erotica changed over time? Is it still a turn on? Is it, do you like certain things? Like what's that experience like for you? It's definitely changed in that I don't read it as much for fun because (laughs) that's what I'm reading so much of the time. I do pay attention to what's happening in the world of erotica. And, you know, I I buy a lot of erotica. I download a lot onto my Kindle um, because I want to see what people are writing. And I love to be surprised because I think you can get a little bit jaded. Like I've been, you know, I've read X, however many hundreds, thousands, maybe of stories. You kind of maybe think, not not that I've read everything, but, you know, just I'm going to read one of my cozy mysteries now because I'm also obsessed with cozy mysteries. <laughs> That's just amazing. And you're like, oh, I want to keep reading this. And and it's erotica or it's erotic romance or whatever. So I think I'm a little more, maybe jaded isn't the right word, but I, it's not necessarily the go-to thing that I read for fun. But I still really like reading erotica and just seeing what people are coming up with because I think there's there's always something new that someone can do with it. And I like to see the people who are doing something new or different. And I also think it's a really amazing time for erotica, just because I'm not reading, you know, an erotica book every day. There are people who pretty much are who can't get enough of erotica. And I think they are coming into it at a really awesome moment because there's such a wide variety. So like whatever you're into, there's probably someone writing about it. Maybe it's dinosaur erotica 
or yeah. <laughs> which uh, there is like... other <laughs> fetish if, if you want to call it a fetish i don't know i don't know that much about dinosaur erotica i've only looked at a lot of the covers but i think it's awesome that that is thriving you know like that there's enough people wanting to read about monster erotica or dinosaur erotica or whatever and there's this one i've been talking up to students and then I'm working on a story for that frisky feminist press is doing. It's a coffee erotic romance. And it's oh my gosh, you know, yes. <laughs> coffee shops or about coffee. And I'm a relatively new coffee drinker, like the last few years, definitely in my 30s. And I'm just fascinated that, um, you know, there's a whole, there's actually two erotica anthologies about coffee coming up, but that, that one, the call is still open. So you guys should look it up for speedfeminist.com because the deadline is until December. Oh, that's so fantastic. What I love, I, first of all, I love about the dinosaur erotica is fiction is so awesome. I mean, fiction lets you just dive into those parts of your brain where the imagination is so rich and just play with that. And then as far as the coffee erotica goes, I'm such a fan of, you know, sensual experience of everyday life, like just really being in that sexy place all the time, not necessarily in a sexual way with another person, but just kind of living juicy. I'm really into that. So I really... Living juicy. (laughs) That was not great. Living juicy. Well, there are so many experiences that we ignore on a day-to-day basis. It's like, you know, if you take the time and really experience the coffee or like you were saying uh jen earlier it smelling the pages of paper yeah uh it, it's a really intense experience if you take the time to do it but if you just ignore it like everything else and you just get down to the meat of it it's like you lose it and i think uh erotica forces you to sit down and really uh experience the senses that you're getting from the pages because if you don't do that you're just reading words you're reading sexy words and so you know, once you start getting into the erotica, you start smelling the paper, you start noticing what's around you and everything. Becomes, at least for me, it becomes a lot more vivid. Well, I think what you just said is something really interesting, because I think for some people, the smelling the paper is the thing. Like, that's the experience that puts them in that mood. But I think for some people, they'd be like, whatever, it's just paper. And to me, that's the part that's so fascinating about human nature that, for some people, it's going to be chemistry, and for some people, it's going to be paper, and for some people, it's going to be bondage, and maybe for some people, it's going to be all those things. But that's the the thing that I tell people to try to put into their writing is whatever that thing is, not necessarily for you, like you don't always have to write about your personal experience, but to try to tap into that mindset and put your characters in that mood that you were just talking about, Dylan, like... To me, that's the part that is always interesting that everyone, maybe not everyone, but most people probably have that about something. And I am nosy. And in my (laughs) journal, I get to talk to people about, you know, what that moment is. And I love hearing that. I mean, I'll never get tired of just talking to people about that kind of stuff. And then when they can tap into it um, in erotica, it's amazing. And I do have to plug a story that's in my book, the big book of orgasms, because it's called book lover by Donna George story. And it's set in a bookstore Mm -hmm. about a woman pretty much like you were talking about ginger. Who's just, she does like pick up these books and it's this super erotic experience for her. And then, you know, someone joins her. So they're sharing it. It's a great story. I own that book. (laughs) You know, as much as I do love the uh, the smell of the pages and the feel of it and everything, I, I do have to hand it to e-readers, though, and tablets, because uh, I-, I have to believe that being able to pick up and purchase erotica uh, on an e-reader or a tablet and read it anywhere you want uh, has to be a big reason why erotica is so popular, or at least so well-read these days, because you you can be somewhere and be doing anything else you want and just sit there reading erotica, because you don't have to paper over the cover of the book or anything. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about what you're reading. You can just, you know, I'm just on your tablet here, just, just sitting there reading it, and you can be doing something nobody else is doing. And that's kind of a turn-on in itself, you know, getting turned on around other people and them not knowing it. I, uh, yeah, I like that. How has electronic publishing like affected, how have you seen that in the 10 years that you've been doing this? Well, I think one thing it's done is allow publishers and self-publishers to try different lengths of pieces. So you have now this whole market for novellas, 
which can range from 10,000 to usually around 50,000 words, you, you probably wouldn't see a print book in that length because it wouldn't be worth it to people to print. People mm -hmm. really like these novellas. And for me, I love to read, but I feel like the older I get, the shorter my attention span is. So <laughs> novella size is great and sometimes short stories and sometimes novels. But I think that the part of why like the novella length is working so well in particular is that you know, people can give it a try and it's, you know, they don't have to spend as much as they might spend on a full book. I think that's also why sometimes people like anthologies because you can pick and choose. So I think one thing the e-reader has done is what you said, Dylan, like allow people to have privacy and also fastness. Like I'm also super impatient. So if I want to read something, sometimes I actually want the paper book, but I want to read it so badly. I'll get the ebook instead because I want to read it immediately. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the, that, and then allowing people to experiment with the length and also self publish. I think that's really mm. changed the game because even though people do still want to work with traditional publishers and you can, a, pub a publisher can do things for you that maybe you can't always do or don't want to do as a self-publisher, that's an option. You're not going to be totally locked out of the marketplace and like, who will publish my thing? You can do it yourself or partner with someone. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's changed the game for everyone because publishers are also looking to those who are self-publishing, who are doing well with it and saying, okay, I want to publish that. Well, certainly... I can talk about erotica all night. Let's take a break and when we come back, maybe talk a little bit about spoken word erotica. And I'd love to speak up here for Dylan and hear a little bit about gender and erotica. So we'll be right back. We at The Swing Set believe that being risk aware and practicing safer sex makes our lifestyle exponentially better. With that in mind, we're partnering with Lucky Bloke, global condom experts, and the best online source for condoms and lube to say no to mediocre condoms and bring the most pleasurable, safer sex directly to our listeners. Go to swingsetcondoms.com to see a specially curated selection of condoms, lubes, and assortments to reintroduce variety and excitement into the protection portion of your playtime. You should especially take note of the deluxe sampler put together by us at The Swing Set for your party and date night kit. Making your condom purchase here supports both us at the Swing Set and the wonderful purveyors of safer sex, Lucky Bloke. SwingSetCondoms.com Hi there, Swing Set fans. In the podcasting world, ranking high on iTunes can make the difference between some listeners and lots of listeners. Do us a favor. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, rate us, and leave us a one-to-two sentence review. If you use an Android phone, visit lifeontheswingset.com forward slash app, and you can download our new app and listen to our whole library on demand. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. We are here with Rachel Kramer Bussell talking about some sexy words, erotica. So where do we want to go? I, I have two specific directions that I think I'd, I could talk all night about, but I want to go in the direction um, that everybody is feeling. So well, I'm still kind of stuck in the sensory piece. I feel like I have my fingers kind of uh feeling my way around i guess the topic in general and so i uh i you obviously read a lot of erotica out loud to people and i think we all do uh in different ways and so how how do, how does it how uh, when you're reading erotica to people how does it feel as opposed to when you're digesting it or even just listening to erotica how does it how do you experience it differently than you do when you're actually reading it i think it's a really different experience I know that if I'm reading something like that chemistry story that I've read a lot of times, it's different because I think I know, I mean, I do sort of know the words, but you also hear something different when you say it out loud, even if you've read it out loud before. I think you don't get that same sensation always from rereading sometimes, but I think hearing it, I think for me, I... I listen to like the words themselves more than, than the meaning. And probably when I'm reading, it's more about the meaning. Um, and I pay more attention because especially if I'm saying it out loud to someone else, which I would be unless I'm reading my own story to myself to practice. Uh, I, I think you really, it, it just forces you to d listen in a different way and, and get something different out of it. 
I actually am a huge reader. I'm trying to get into audiobooks because my books are available on audiobook and uh, one of my narrators, Rose Caraway, who also has a podcast, The Kiss Me Quicks, is amazing. And the books of mine that she's narrated are actually doing better than print and ebook combined. So I'm like, wow. I have to get on that and figure out why, like, what, why people are listening. And it's this really weird experience because I love her voice. She has this really beautiful voice and I could just listen to it all day. And so I decided to listen to something that's not my book, cause, so I don't know what's <laughs> happening. And I <I've> <laughs> listened to this uh, horror novel that she narrated called Shady Palms by this guy, Alan Dusk. And even though I don't really listen, read horror, I read mystery. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll like it. And I started listening, and it was really good. Like, all this drama is happening in the first few minutes. But because I was just sitting there with my laptop and I'm so used to using my laptop to go online and do stuff, I started going online a little bit and then I realized I had no idea what just happened because my mind started to drift away. And so I don't know if some people are just more geared towards that listening experience and can focus more and some people are more readers um, or if it's just my attention span issue. <laughs> but I do, I mean, I I think the audio market, especially for erotica, is only going to keep growing. I think that privacy issue we mentioned before with the e-readers and also people really want that experience. I think it is more sensual and intimate than just reading to yourself. I would agree with that. And I think that, you know, certainly from the audiobook perspective, I don't do well with an idle brain. So when I'm in the car, it's always a podcast or a book or something. I'm always listening to some things. But I can totally relate, Rachel, to the busy hand thing and busy mind. Like if I if I am staying put and there are other things to do, unless they're like physical things, you know, like, I don't know, working in the garden or something like that, then I'm I'm not necessarily able to mentally multitask. So for me, a reading experience and an audio book experience are really almost different animals. And I've found just trying my hand at erotica a number of times in different ways that there are times that I write the story and then there are some times that I write it's it's more poetic and it it is something that I think would be better suited to be read aloud and and enjoyed aloud but certainly even read like when it like the words feel good to say the alliteration or the you know those types of things words feel good to say yeah and 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 it's funny though because I look at those different stories and m the stories that I write that are more character based or maybe are a little more raw are really like a visceral like bodily experience whereas the stories that I've written that are more um literary are are a, a lighter still a sexy experience but really a more sensual verbal experience than maybe the the hardcore turn on that I might get with the more raw pieces of erotica. I mean, I think there's also something to the like you just said the difference as the creator because I've always written about aspects of my life even before I was writing about sex, I wrote about other personal topics and I had no problem writing them down and even putting my name on them and putting my photo on them. Um, but reading them out loud to people live is a totally different, scarier experience. <laughs> and I reading huh. since that first story was published. I've pretty much been doing reading since 2000 or 2001. And it is still really scary, especially if it's a personal story. And some of my stories do stem from my personal life and even if no one else knows that, I know that. So there, there have been times when I've read really personal stories and it's, I mean, you can probably see me shaking. Sure. I go back to that place. Mm. Like I go back to that where I was in the action in real life, even though I've turned it into something else that's art, that's, 
you know, maybe it's true-ish, but it's not necessarily a transcription of what happened, but something happens in my brain when I'm reading it out loud. Whereas when I'm writing, I can sort of go into a mental space and just sort of work them together to create a story. But when I say it out loud, it just, I don't know, it, it's more intimate. Sure. Well, it's all pretty vulnerable. And I can imagine that, like you said, even if no one else knows that it, it actually happened, or at least your your bodily experience or mind experience of that, and then, of course, you have to filter it through into the words, that that no one else might know it, but you still feel it. Like you are still in that and, and it's going to create a physiological response. And, you know, that's really sexy to consider that someone who's reading their erotica or doing some spoken word stuff, if you go out to, you know, even a sexy poetry slam or something like that, that you don't really know if it's if it's just complete fiction or if it's sort of a little bit fiction or if it could be a word for word experience that they had as best as they can recall that's that's pretty hot to consider that that you never really know well i mean i think people that consume that uh that are sitting there listening or reading or anything can tell when it's not not that it's authentic that it actually happened but that whoever wrote it or whoever's speaking about it uh, is really feeling it. Or at least I can tell. It's it's the difference between uh, a good product and a great product to me. I think there is, I mean, I don't know, you know, I never, I don't really think about like in the stories I'm reading when people send them to me, I don't really want to know whether it's true or not because it's not really relevant to my experience as an editor. Um, but with my stories, there are some that may not fit into these categories, but there are some that are humorous uh, the Monica Lewinsky story was pretty funny. Uh, one of my favorite ones <laughs> called doing the dishes. And it is about a woman who has a dishwashing fetish. And I kind of do, but hers is much more sexual. So I have some stories that are just, they're, they're, they're funny. And they're much easier to read out loud because people laugh. And sure. <laughs> they're, you know when they're going to laugh. And you're like, ha ha, like I'm making a joke about whatever it is. And then when you're reading a story that's really personal and it's about, I don't know, like BDSM or something, and in your mind you're going back to this really intimate moment, it, it's different. And it's also different to be reading something that you know might be turning people on live in the room um, versus just making them laugh. And that's a tension I've never really figured out even after do I used to run a reading series in New York for five years I, I still get nervous and I still sometimes chicken out of reading something that is that personal because it just I can write it no problem but reading it is it's more vulnerable for me mm. well it's more you feel more exposed and with the personal than with reading some so and have you know do you always read something personal when you've had it, or I know when you've done the workshops, you've read somebody else's, but do you find that you read your your stuff just less you know, often? No, like if I'm that? doing a reading, I'll probably read something of mine, but then I can pick, like, do I read something funnier, or even do I read a funny part of a story, or do I read something oh, more see. intense? And you know, it's it's always it's a case by case basis. I think that people remember, well, people remember both. Um, I think people remember the really intense stories. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's, an, it's a funny thing. I think some people, this is not just relevant to erotica, I think some people are more comfortable on a stage. And I would even count what you guys do, like podcasts, as a stage in terms of just being able to talk and, you know, be themselves or be whatever version of themselves uh, with their voice, I, I can do that much better in writing. I can sort mm -hmm. of associate the fact that I know people are going to read it, but I don't, I'm not thinking about that while I'm writing. And if you're speaking to people, obviously you're, you're aware that they're listening to you and that <laughs> awareness gets into my head and kind of throws me off. Mm. Yeah. Another thing that I, uh, want to touch on now that just listening to um, talking about reading it and writing it. I know whenever I've looked up 
erotica online, I often get hits for like photos and artwork and, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, talking about it being that experience, like we've just talked about and reading it, how do you feel that erotica um, connects in relationship to other sexy content, like um, erotic photography, or artwork, or even, you know, movies for that matter? I mean, I think that those all can be erotica or porn. Like, I mean, I think porn, obviously, when we say that we probably nowadays mean movies, or, you know, images online video i think that's just become that shorthand for that Mm -hmm. um but i think they're all part of a larger thing of artwork that's made to turn people on basically i think it's just different different forms of it you know and i think some people are going to react more to one one of those than the other or maybe it depends on what you know what day it is or what mood they're in which of those they're going to prefer and also none of those is one big thing. I mean, some people might have a specific aspect of porn or visual art or, or written erotica that they um, most gravitate towards. Mm-hmm. But um, but I don't think, you know, I don't think they are so separate. I mean, they're separate in that they're separate um, mediums, but I, they're, I think they have a through line in the intention of it. Mm. you know that that's what they're designed to do so (laughs) you know i I don't think it's like an insult to say oh erotica is supposed to turn people on people are going to get off on it like that's great that's Uh, awesome you know yeah i mean yeah well and given the the idea of photos and video when it comes to pornography there's this kind of cultural construct that those are things that that typically is the male entree into this the sexy stuff and yet we look at erotica and you know the romance novel which you know is almost the same thing a lot of times and see that is often this entree if we can go you know to that gender binary piece of like well that's the way the women do it is the women kind of come in this door and I'm curious just Rachel, with your experiences, you know, what's what's that gender erotica mashup? Because I certainly know lots of sexy men who write erotica, one in particular, and I know that they enjoy reading it. And yet it's not necessarily something that's face forward for all of us. But yet, you know, amidst girlfriends it's kind of like oh have you read this have you read that it's kind of like you know you switch off you have book club and people are a little bit more forward about being willing to share that amidst the girls so to speak and so I'd love to hear your perspective on either submissions you get or folks who come to your readings how how's that working in terms of who the audience is and how they relate to erotica I mean, I think the majority of people sending me stories, taking my classes, and um, and reading erotica are women. Um, but I don't think that that means that therefore women are, you know, more into reading and men are like necessarily more into watching, um, you know, or you know, looking at images. I think like whatever gender you are, you may or may not want to do those things. Um, but I think that I think that part of why, especially now, we're seeing this rise of women writing erotica and erotic romance and where that's coming from is that women and girls are, whether we're taught it or we do it, I mean, I, I've always talked about sex and sexual topics even before I was having sex with my friends, female friends mostly, and my sense is, and maybe Dylan, you want to chime in on this, is that women generally talk more in the nitty gritty and more about a lot of things related to sex and how those affect our lives. Whereas I think with a lot of men, those conversations aren't as in depth. And I think part of that is because for women, sex is more fraught like there's more things to consider like if I do this will someone think I'm a slut and you know what is what does it mean that I liked this thing or I didn't like this or that I 
slept with someone on the first date. I mean, I, I think that there's just so many more considerations that we take on and that are put on us, women specifically. And I think that we work a lot of those out within the course of the erotica. And I think that not probably not as many men have those. Now, some men do. I'm not saying no one. But I think that those things that are we've probably been thinking about for a really long time are what wind up often in some form in the erotica. Well, you touched on like three or four things that I really that that really connected to my personal experience in the in the opposite way, because uh, it, we're we're all socialized in certain ways, and and, and especially boys are taught to not think about things like that because first of all we're not supposed to feel feelings and emotions and so trying to figure out you know what is that how does this make me feel that's pretty much off the menu until you've decided to break out of that whole you know i'm i'm not going to feel anything thing uh so there's not a lot of sitting around with other boys talking about how uh being around girls makes you feel it's more huh, she's got boobs and uh it, it's a very <laughs> no really it, it I, I am I wish I was joking, but it, it's really a lot of that, like, you know, she's she's hot. I'd like to do things to her. But it, even that's not really descriptive. But, it, you're, it's all... but you're thinking about these things that I was just mentioning. You're, ju- you're just not talking about them. Is that correct? Well, we're, we're encouraged not to think about them. So we that, that that's the level of our discourse with each other. And when we think about what it's like with us, uh, we don't reduce it to, you know, the core components of, you know, how, how it affects us, what we feel about it, things like that. We just know that we like it, and then we're also socialized to go get it. And because you know the, uh, and because a lot of video por- and 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 a lot of visual pornography is out there, we go and get that, and that's where we get our fill, because it's accessible and it's everywhere. And so we're not, you know, we're not supposed to really think and feel about it. And the easy stuff is everywhere, so that's where we consume our stuff early on. And so I feel like uh, we're all capable of feeling the same level of emotion and feeling but it takes a lot of men a longer time to get there because we haven't sat around the table talking with other guys about how uh having relationships feel or uh what their sexuality feels like because again we're not supposed to explore our sexuality other than uh liking girls and liking boobs and so once we get past that you know there's still a big learning curve to it and i i i'm willing to except that, you know, men may be predisposed to liking certain things a little bit differently than women, just because we do experience the world differently sometimes, whether it's because of our positions in the world, because, you know, we're men and we have, you know, a certain level of uh, of, of privilege, or because we're just a little bit physically different, you know, we, we uh, don't, ex- most of us don't accept things into our bodies during sex, we put our bodies into other people during sex. And so there's a there's a, a common experience, but then it diverges a little bit, and it, I think it I think it really informs how we experience things. And so I think it takes us a little bit longer to get there because we're so uh, focused on putting out as opposed to taking in. And I, but I, I do think that where men um, do get that moment of, or maybe it's not a moment, but a sense of okay, there are things that I want to talk about. It is when you're stepping out of like the heterosexual, um, monogamous, like dominant paradigm of what we think as a culture, like manly is supposed to be. And, and I think I, I do see a lot of some of those issues in, in erotica. And those are some of the things that I like to deal with too, where people are stepping out of the bounds of what we're supposed to want. And that, that goes like, for other issues too. I wrote a story once about a a couple, I think, I think they're married and the guy loses a lot of weight and he's like really happy, this male female couple, and he's really happy and like girls are flirting with him and he's kind of soaking in all this attention, but his wife actually misses the way he looked before and is a little bit put off by this transformation and she kind of wants to take a little bit back of what they used to have um and I really like to do stuff like that where I'm sort of challenging this idea that all women want a man who looks like x because Mm -hmm. I think those are the kinds of stories where 
a character wants something different than what we're told we're supposed to want, whether that's around, you know, gender or sexual orientation or monogamy. Like those are the the stories that for me often resonate the most because those characters are taking a risk and stepping outside of that and dealing with what does that mean? I think that's what I I enjoy the most about your anthologies is that it's such a wonderful just array of of genders and orientations and fetishes and likes and dislikes and um it's so open to what anybody could be turned on by it's not a certain look it's not a certain um thing it never tells you this is what you think should be sexy it actually um makes the fact that people are individual in what turns them on even um even more wonderful because they're so well represented in all the books thank you so much that really means a lot and that's something i really try to emphasize especially when i'm teaching is that there's no one right way to write erotica because we all have different ways of being in the world and things that we think about or something that might turn us on and you know there you know there's no like better fetish to write about than another one it's what you can bring to it and you know if you like um i do this assignment where i have people write about a food item and you know you could write about champagne or whipped cream or oysters or some traditional aphrodisiac or you could write about like a sausage or a banana or something <laughs> phallic but you know I, I always say maybe you can write about brussels sprouts like I don't know what you're gonna do with brussels sprouts but maybe you can make them into some you know if you can make them into an erotic scenario like great or you know or with the coffee one like, and it's funny because I'm I'm the story I'm working on is sort of inspired. Well, actually, I went in a different direction, but I was inspired by the fact that my boyfriend hates coffee, but he really <laughs> likes the smell of coffee. Sure. Yeah. So there's all this like richness around what if one person likes one thing and another person doesn't, in this case, around food or beverage. But I think that could also extend to all sorts of things. And those are things that real people deal with where one person is interested in X and the other is interested in Y and how do you work out those issues? And I think erotica is a really great place to look at some of those things. And yes, its primary purpose is to turn people on. But in the course of that, I think you can definitely also comment on what messages our culture is sending us about sex and sometimes maybe argue back to those or present a different view of what's sexy. And I and it's interesting to me as both a writer of nonfiction, including essays about my sex life and journalism around sex and erotica, sometimes I think that you can be more articulate about something you're passionate about uh, in the fictional realm because you can have that poetry that Ginger was talking about. You can play with the words and I think evoke different kinds of emotions than you necessarily could telling a straightforward story essay like you know I did this and I'm turned on by this I don't I, I I've written a lot of pieces like that but I don't always want to say it in that way sometimes I want to be more fanciful about it Sure. Well, I'll admit that I have a papaya story and a papaya thing um, that may see the light of day at some point and um, was very, very fun and sexy to write. And I wrote it over a long stretch of time, some of it while I was on vacation, eating papaya, go figure. And um, it's it's one of my favorite things to to play with thinking about like you said that food idea but then also what I love about it is talking about that with prof and you know telling him my little papaya thing which he's very aware I have a papaya thing and love that you have a papaya thing oh you do awesome yeah I mean it's it's you know how can you not especially when it's like juicy and ripe and um my mouth is watering okay um <laughs> but you know he knows about my papaya thing and he is very sweet and tolerant of it but you know certain times like you said Rachel like like those turn-ons don't necessarily match up but it's an opportunity to expand each other's minds to 
not just talking intellectually about your turn-ons, but bringing someone into your emotional and sensory experience, so your physical experience of your turn-ons. And that synthesis of all of the different aspects of self, you know, the, the mental or cognitive, the the emotional and the physical, really when you can integrate all of those into writing, especially when it's something as simple as enjoying a papaya, then it brings other people into a part of you that, like you said, isn't necessarily accessible when you are just putting the factual words down to paper because you're really only accessing that cognitive piece rather than a deeper emotional sense or even a physical sensory aspect of your own personal experience. A lot of why I I keep coming back to erotica is to experience somebody else's reality and somebody else's uh, senses when when they're writing something because I'm a... I'm, I'm a guy... And I don't know what it feels like to be a woman, but when I read something written by somebody that's different than me and experience what they're experiencing through that, it's really intense or or a situation that I would never either have the opportunity to try or the inclination to try in real life, but I can play with it and learn it and feel it from somebody else's perspective. It's, uh, it, it, it's really intense and it gives me a little bit of a better understanding of what other people feel on a day-to-day basis when I can't generate that feeling out of, you know, my own experience. You both tapped into something that I think is really important and that we sometimes forget about, which is fantasy for the sake of fantasy. I think that Mm -hmm. sometimes we assume that if someone has a fantasy or writes something down or talks about something that they want to do it tomorrow or today, and maybe they do, but maybe it can also live in that fantasy space. And I think that's what erotica does for a lot of both readers and writers is allows them to live in that fantasy world and think about these things in a safe comfortable possibly you know erotic thought-provoking whatever else kind of way without the impetus of okay so what are we going to do about it maybe that's what you're going to do about it is think about it and that can be totally hot i mean i think the same goes for dirty talk like you're not necessarily doing those things, but if you're thinking about them really hard and you're in a moment with someone and exchanging those, it's as if you're doing them almost. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's, I mean, that's both a personal interest of mine, but also I think that we kind of forget that people appreciate that those fantasies and they, they can, that that's a necessary, that for a lot of people, that's a necessary part of their sex life. But just because they're not doing whatever their fantasy is about, whether because they physically cannot or, you know, the circumstances of their lives don't allow them to or they don't want to do it today, but maybe they want to do it in a a few years or a few weeks. I mean, whatever it is, like those fantasies are still really valuable. And some of the things that I've tapped into in my own writing are are fantasies that I never would have explicitly said, oh, I have a fantasy about this, but I sat down to write and all of a sudden this thing came out. And whether it's my fantasy or my characters or there's overlap, like who knows, but some of those things have been the most revelatory things to me um, that just sort of appeared somewhere in my mind. And they sometimes they freak me out a little, but that that's still important to me to access that. Do you get a lot of feedback from your readers in that respect and how, you know, how it's helped them to maybe realize a fantasy that they were afraid to, you know, bring to the forefront, not necessarily do, but, or did it teach them something Did they, you know, do you get some really good feedback or is it just erotica is not something that you hear from um, your readers very often? I, I think that is happening, but I don't, really hear from people in that way of, you know, we read this story about X and we, we did this with it. I get more feedback of like which ones people preferred and which ones they didn't necessarily. So I kind of have a sense of the stories and authors that people 
particularly liked. But I, I, I think people maybe are shy. I, I did actually meet someone recently who told me that she's in a long distance relationship and they read erotica to each other and they mark up the books and they tell each other which parts they liked. And I think they actually do act some of it out. And I think because it's long distance, it helps them have this thing that they're sharing because they each have the same book and are reading the same things. And, mm. and it's, I was like, wow, that's amazing. I have a special request for you, Jen. And it's on, on that vein, because I uh, would love to sit with you sometime, kind of like we are now and put on uh, an audio book of some erotica and just listen to it together. And kind of experience it together at the same time because that sounded like a great idea, uh, and I would like to explore that sometime. So I love oh. that we live in an age where you can do that. Oh yeah, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And and yes, I absolutely I accept that as a date. That sounds amazing. That also sounds like fun for a party. To oh. oh, I actually went to an erotica reading party and it was awesome some people brought their own some people read out of books oh it was great oh i'm writing this down right now <laughs> as dylan writes that down and we all kind of hold that sexy vibe we're gonna take a break for a commercial and we will come back and do some business so hold on and we'll be right back This is Dan, Don, and Karen, and we are the co-producers of the annual polyamory event Beyond the Love, Poly Summit 2014. Beyond the Love is a low-cost, three-day event on November 7th through 9th, held in a newly renovated hotel in Columbus, Ohio. You'll find a variety of classes and workshops led by people who live in poly relationships from around the country. As well as fun and interactive extras like poly speed mixer, game night, and a masquerade dance. There will be a wealth of opportunity to learn tools, techniques, and communication skills to enhance our poly relationships. We'll provide a safe environment for meeting with other like-minded people in a supportive and inclusive community. We welcome all those living a poly lifestyle or considering doing so. We are passionate about recognizing poly as a relationship choice and sharing common experiences on our many different paths. Find out more at beyondthelove.org. We'll We'll see you there. there. When it comes to online dating, we here at The Swing Set believe that Cassidy is the best one out there. It looks great, it's intuitive and easy to use, and it's simply full of potential sexy friends. Still the fastest growing online swinger dating site in the world, Cassidy has been our go-to site for the last three years. If you sign up using our link at lifeontheswingset.com slash K-A-S-I-D-I-E, you'll get some free time to explore the site. And you can decide for yourself if Cassidy is the site for you. Hope to see you there at Cassidy.com. Welcome back to Life on the Swing Set, the podcast. We are still here with Rachel, and we couldn't leave this episode without hearing from you, Rachel, about the things that you want to say to aspiring erotica writers. What are the key things that all of those breathless writers out there need to know? I think the biggest thing you need to know is that you you can write erotica about whatever you want to write it about. So whatever speaks to you, like whatever you is, whether it's something happening in your life or something you just thinking about. um, I don't I don't want to give the impression that you have to write about your own personal interests because you could write about characters who are totally different from you. But I think the more that you can tap into that personal vibe that we were touching on before, that it's coming from somewhere authentic, um, you know, the the stronger your piece is going to be. I think you don't want to say, okay, so-and-so writes like this. I don't write like anything like that, but I'm going to try to because they're doing well. You you could try that, but that would not be my advice to you. Um, so I would just try to think about what, you know, what are the things that you want to say? So, you know, maybe because we're on Life on the Swing Set, you know, maybe you're a swinger or maybe you are non-monogamous or whatever. I mean, I think those are really rich topics to explore in erotica. And there's 
there's a lot you can do with that. And, you know, whatever your thing is, um, you know, just thinking about that and how to bring it to life on the page. Ooh, I like that. How to bring it to life on the page. I like that yeah. a lot. Awesome. I don't know. I think I need to read some monogamous erotica now. Like, ooh, baby, I want to spend the rest <laughs> of my life with you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's priceless. Well, I think we should do some business. Business sounds good. So awesome. yeah, you, just business? so you know, Rachel. Usually at the end of the show, we just show we just kind of shoot the shit and talk about things that are going on in our lives. And um, uh, I know that we, we just got back. Well, we actually all of us just got back from Catalyst Con. Uh, I know I was in on your session, uh, Rachel. Uh, you did the part of the shameless self promotion session, and uh, I admit I was not live tweeting. I was not a one of the, one of the people with their device in front of them. I was, however, in front of you with a uh, paper and a pen, and so I did take quite a few good notes, uh, much like I did with the rest of Catalyst Con. So I just wanted to say thanks for that, and I'm hoping to put some of that stuff in practice soon. <laughs> I had such a great time. I'm still sort of coming down from it and gearing up for the next one. You know, it, it's funny. The I I've I've had you know con drops a thing. I get it, and I've mm -hmm. experienced it now. But this is the first con of any kind uh whether it's been you know a sex positive convention or just a anything where i haven't had that drop i've i came back I, I live in chicago and so i came back from la wanting to spread the awesome feeling that i had to everybody and so i've tried i know i know we're like two and a half three weeks out right now so you know i'm starting to maybe drop off a little bit but i'm still trying really hard to hold on to that feeling and to kind of bring it to uh some people out here as much as i can and I know, you know, we don't have the weather or, you know, all the uh, cool people want to put one place or everything. But I'm, damn it, I'm trying because. <sighs> Dylan, yes, do not lose that loving feeling, Dylan. <laughs> Please don't. I go. was just in Chicago like five days ago, I think. I, I totally <laughs> lost track because I've been in a thousand, like a lot of cities. But first of all, the weather was beautiful. I had an amazing time. Yeah, you got um, lucky. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had so much fun at the museum with you. That right. was so awesome. And I was like, I am such a, not just sex geek, but geek that <laughs> the healthy uh, field trip scavenger hunt. And it was so much fun. And I, I was just like, this is awesome. Someone should write an erotica story about this. I Ooh. wanted to join you guys. I was in St. Louis. For some reason, I have to leave when all the cool people come. <laughs> it's, 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 it's tragic. It happens all the goddamn time. <sighs> yeah. But I'm, I'm really glad you had a good time while you were here. Because you know what? Yeah, our museums are awesome. And we've had shitty weather this year. But it came out in force in a good way for you. So that's, <sighs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> I'm so glad all you guys had such a good time. The pictures were fantastic. The <laughs> tweeted tweeted pictures were awesome yeah, we're gonna have uh, more i just spent the pretty much the entire day captioning so we're gonna go through and mm -hmm. do like a, a special little uh photo thing on facebook of like the best of there's just so many it's hard to choose i think i went through almost 200 photos today Whoa. yeah i love that after i was just seeing dirty things everywhere everywhere and yes happened. and i walked from wherever whatever l stop argyle i think that i got off to go to early to bed and um i i only had a few blocks to walk and i saw a sign that said speed hump ahead <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you just wanted to like, take a photo and catch we're not still on the scavenger hunt because hello <laughs> i think we should totally just do that on twitter like just have that be a thing we need a hashtag for that just oh, yeah. we should always be on a you know on a sexy the, on a sexy quest on a sec on a sexy quest <laughs> a i like it quest. Sexy. yeah, yeah. Ple pleasure quest yet again <laughs> oh that's awesome well that's that's one thing just in the spirit of erotica that's one thing my business that i get a kick out of is every now and then coop and i which we miss you coop um coop oh. and i go back and forth on twitter um with our twitter erotica and I don't know if that's actually a thing or if that's just a thing that we just, I mean, I can't imagine we're the only two people on the face no, of the no, earth. No, I've seen it. I know yeah. there, I, I was with a, a group on, on Twitter that I followed that it was, it would be Twitterotica Fridays. Oh, okay. And they would tell stories 
a, a tweet at a time. Yeah. See, during, I don't, during the day. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I have the attention. Yeah, I don't know if I have the attention span for something I can't <laughs> digest in one tweet. Like I, I, I would have a hard time with the serial aspect of the tweet and then a tweet and then a tweet. Oh, but I, I try, I like the challenge I, and I'm sure I could get into it if I, I had an attention span, which I don't. Um, but if I could actually like when I construct them in 140 characters, I'm all proud of myself because you can convey a lot in 140 characters and it's really fun and sexy. So um, I think we need to resurrect that as well. But I also, on the theme of writing, I've been doing a lot and I think it's just, Rachel, it's been your vibe in my in my space lately, reading your books and I've been writing a lot of sexy writing, just playing with it. And I actually read um the rope master's story that he sent me today he's um writes his sexy erotica and oh my gosh i almost fell off my chair like i'm still <laughs> like my hair is totally blown back and it was so amazing and good and it was just one of those like why am i not doing this all the time why am i not I, am I not writing erotica, giving it to people? Like, you know, I always laugh and say, I need to thank people if I have an orgasm on their, you know, if I'm masturbating and I have an orgasm, thanks to them. I feel like I need to write it down now and write it into a short story and then like hand it over to them. Like, this is what my fantasy was when I mm. orgasmed to you. Ta-da! But um, I don't know. That seems like that. a lot of effort. What's that? Who wouldn't want that? I mean, like, that's such a huge honor. It is. I agree. It is. So I, I'm, I'm trying to fit it into practice at this point, but I agree with you. It's a huge honor and, you know, it's just, it's, you can do it anytime. You can read a little Twitter erotica. You can pull out your, you know, little story that you've been working on. I don't know. It's such a charge. It's so fantastic. But so my business was very germane to the topic, but that was my business nonetheless. Mm. <laughs> I just want to remind you, Jen, of the time that I took somewhere between five to seven minutes in the little in the middle of one of our episodes to tell you about uh, the way that I approach a new person yes. uh, when giving them a hand job. Yes. And and we we decided, by the way, Rachel, we decided to use hand job for both uh, you know people playing with cocks and people playing with vaginas, at least for the purpose of that episode. I like so it. Uh, I just kind of sat back and I went into this mood and I was talking about how I feel when I'm with somebody and I did it for about I was I was only going to do it for 30 seconds and it ended up being five to seven minutes and then <laughs> uh, I, we actually they joke that it's like the 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 podcast that launched a thousand orgasms like, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah I just wanted you to remember that specifically Jen. I I am uh, and it was it, it did hit a point where you quit talking and then nothing happened like we were all just like uh, 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 can I just be back in 10 minutes? Like we couldn't really, I couldn't complete a sentence, but I, I pictured all, I rarely, it's so funny. You said earlier in the um, show, Rachel, about like when you read in front of someone, it's a very different experience than actually writing it because when you're writing, you can just write in a vacuum. You're not really anticipating or thinking about your audience really and that's always been kind of my own mind game that I play with myself that when we're doing this fun little thing we call a podcast that we're just all talking to each other and no one ever really hears it and then all of a sudden <laughs> boom lots it's of people hear it you think. oh you know <laughs> it's all right um but the people who do hear it tend to you know bump things around on Twitter and send you little messages and it's really awesome but it does kind of shake me out of my my, oh my gosh, I'm just, you know, hanging out talking with my my lovies. But um, I did picture Dylan uh, after that episode, like all of the people like hmm. listening and then getting in a little deeper and then like, oh my gosh, he's still talking. Like I'm really turned on. I might be able to <laughs> get an <laughs> orgasm out of this. Keep talking. Keep talking. Oh my gosh. So I call back one second with the advice because Ginger, I think that that thing of people being nervous about what are people going to think is something that totally intimidates a lot of people out of not necessarily writing erotica, but sending it out. I think there is so much fear, especially because it's erotica and it's about sex. People think, you know, if someone reads it and doesn't like it, like it's more, it's worse than if, you know, they wrote something else that people don't like. So 
I think like you have to find a way to get over that fear because, you know, you just never know who's going to respond to your writing. And if you don't, if you want to publish it, but you're nervous, like, I think you have to figure out a way to get over the nervousness and to see what happens. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And certainly I even have my own trepidation around sharing that writing as opposed to other writing. And so I can appreciate that that's, that's a thing. So I love it. I love, love, love it that you have given me specifically <laughs> in stating that permission to really, you know, let, let, let it loose, let it out. Let Ginger, it I'm going to, I'm going to email you next time I have a call for submissions. I mean, no pressure, but I'm going <laughs> to email you. So I'm just throwing it out there. Awesome. It's going to be a whole book about papayas, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh Here. my gosh. Well, I, I'm, I'm willing to give it a try. I'm willing to give it a try. And gosh, with you saying that, how can I turn you down? I absolutely <laughs> cannot turn you down. Wow. Well, with that, Rachel, I'd love for you to tell the swing setters where they can find you and what projects you have going on now that we really need to know about and how they can get in touch with you, how they can follow you, all that good stuff. My website is rachelkramerbustle.com and I have a newsletter which you should sign up for because I give away free stuff to people who subscribe. Not everyone, but you know, like you to, when you get the newsletter, there may be some goodies. Uh, I'm Raquelita on Twitter, R-A-Q-U-E-L-I-T-A. -E uh, I post there a lot. I have a couple events coming up. I'm teaching an online erotica writing class starting October 16th at litreactor.com. All this is on my website. And I'm teaching in New York at the New York Academy of Sex Education, October 24th. So I have those coming up and then who knows? So I will share online when I have more stuff going on. Oh, and uh, my new books are Hungry for More and The Big Book of Submission. Ooh. 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 I think I might be. <laughs> I like uh... those ooh's. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I want, I want every time I say those titles, you guys to be around and just say, ooh. Mm. We hot. would totally do that for you. Yeah. That would we be would awesome. totally, it'd be like, you know, like the laugh track, but it'd be like yeah. the um, turn on oh, yeah. track. I, I can make that happen for you, by the way. I'll, I can send you an audio file of uh, just a uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. You could just have it on your phone and when you're doing readings and then you <laughs> say the title, you could just hit it and, and everybody look around like, where did that come from? But they'd be really impressed and they'd be totally down with it. And then oh I just gosh. like, I don't know, I, I, then I'd be torn, like, should I just be like, oh, like, that's just my entourage, or I would, I would be like, no, you have to go to lifeontheswingset.com and listen to more of it. There you go. A whole podcast of just, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We could absolutely do that. Awesome. It's a little service we provide. So, first of all, thank you so much, Rachel, for this awesome discussion. It was really a lot of fun, and we would love to have you back anytime. Thank you. I had a great time, too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Swing Setters, you can join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the swing set. We are on Twitter at Swing Set Life, at Ginger and the Prof, at Technogatia, at Dylan the Thomas. And we've also instituted the new site Twitter feed, which is on the swing set. That's at on the swing set. If you want to get all of our articles and the podcast posts and all that good stuff, you can check out this podcast, daily blogs, articles, and toy reviews on our website at lifeontheswingset.com. You can email us at contact at lifeontheswingset.com. You can call us and leave us a voicemail at 573-55-SWING. That's 573-557-9464. You can now support us by going to lifeontheswingset.com slash support. Drop us a tip. And you can find our other great podcasts like Carnal Copia, Eat the Rude Cast, and the Resurgent Kinky Geeks. Yay, Yay. Miko! Yep, we're coming back. Woohoo! At swingset.fm. Thanks for swinging by.
Have a sexy business? Love the swing set? Let's put these two great things together. The Swing Set Network has advertising and sponsorship packages available for our websites and podcasts. Email advertising at lifeontheswingset.com for more information. Thanks.